Welcome back to The Heat. We're talking about the meeting of Chinese President Xi Jinping and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Wuhan and its significance for China-India relations. And Sarah, if we look domestically at the impact of this meeting in India, Prime Minister Modi has an election coming up next year in 2019. Does, you look at a meeting like this, here's the man, he's the statesman, does it help him domestically? Oh, I think it does help him domestically. Uh, he is seen in India as being a a robust and brave diplomat who has championed India's uh, position on a variety of fronts uh, with, with, in a very forthright manner, including against China. Uh, frankly, last year, I, I personally don't think it was the, the best position in which, when, when India, when they had the Doklam issue that India should have gone across the border, but the fact of the matter is that once India went across the border, it was willing to stay there as long as it took to have that issue resolved. They were not just going to walk back on their own. And that sort of resolution uh, has, that sort of resolution impresses uh, the domestic electorate. That sort of resolution, I would say also, not in terms of the boundary issue, not in terms of what happened last year in Doklam, but the fact that he was then willing to shift his position so, so dramatically, I would say, and go out and seek a relationship with President Xi. And also, sorry, I'm backing up out here, but even on the, at the, at, during the Doklam issue, he was the one who went to President Xi and said, come on, now we need, to, we need to, to, to settle this because it's getting a little bit out of hand. And, and so he has shown himself, not just domestically, but also to his international interlocutors, yeah. that this is a man who you can do business with. And of course, India-China relations on some issues like the boundary issue and on other issues are not yet at that state where you can get real great outcomes. But to have Narendra Modi out there uh, gives the impression to the Chinese that when those issues do get firmed up, that we will have a, an interlocutor at the other end who could pull the trigger and important agreements can be signed. So I think it will help him definitely domestically, but it will also help him in terms of his negotiations with China down the line. Zarawa, did you want to say something? Yeah, so this, you know, this question of domestic politics is actually quite an interesting one. Uh, my own impression is that, uh, at least from the Indian side, and maybe I can even comment on the Chinese side, I don't think the other the other, which is the interlocutor, that is China from the average Indian, holds such a powerful, clear-cut image. It's a far more complex relationship. So unlike, for instance, Pakistan, where the question of uh, hostility is based on real uh, a history of, of deep conflict and, and armed confrontations, we don't have a similar relationship with China. So the idea that Indian governments might want to uh, create a provocation uh, to generate domestic public opinion and for electoral advantage does not hold. In fact, uh, if anything, I would argue, perhaps uh, contrary to what others might believe, that a beneficial relationship with China actually helps uh, Indian governments. So that sense of nationalism does not apply too far. I don't want to take it too far. There's the impression that, and even on the Chinese side, we saw it during the last years, uh, the border crisis, where uh, people were simply unaware of this relationship that they had with India. And you saw the, uh, the Chinese media having to bring out some of the history, the legacy, some of the sort of the troubled past that both sides have had. And so I would say this is a slate that's still a blank, a partially, and can be written. So it's dangerous to play games when you have a population on both sides that still doesn't know about the other side. If anything, they might want greater contact. So I think the both leaderships need to sort of uh, consider that. And it's not a typical relationship where it's a bottom-up uh, kind of a, 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 an impulse to compete, for instance. You know, it's, it, they, there's a complicated relationship, yes. But there are also uh, areas where people-to-people -people contact is something where it's intriguing uh, the average Indian. They would want to learn more about East Asia and China. Shindo, here we have two countries, two major Asian powers. Uh, they represent something like 40% of the world's population. Do you see them coming together and engaging more uh, together in some of the major issues facing the world right now, some of the major challenges, things like uh, terrorism, uh, the, the climate change issue, trade and economic relationships? Well, yes, uh, uh, Arnold, th that's right. Uh, if you look at uh, on trade and investment, obviously, they find the common language. Uh, I don't think it's difficult. Of, 
Uh, of course, right now on the Indian side, the concern is like the growing deficit uh, in terms of trade with China. But China is ready to help solve that problem. Like China can purchase more, uh, you know, besides this cotton and iron ore. Uh, you know, natural resources, but also what about like uh, IT products? Uh, what about uh, the uh, information technologies from India? And also China is going to have uh, like China, the first China International Import Expo later this year in November. I think uh, the Indian side could uh, you know, take advantage of that opportunity to just expedite uh, all what they can sell to the Chinese side to help narrow this uh, uh, this gap between trade. And if you look at uh, other issues globally, climate change, I think China and India, they are playing their role. And in particular, China, let's say, playing a leadership role in uh, supporting this Paris Agreement and continuing this Paris Agreement, uh, uh, given that Washington basically agrees uh, or decides to withdraw from Paris Agreement. Right. So that's a very important uh, step for the two countries. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I want to f follow Xu. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there are some other very important issues on this uh, issue, uh, on this also. Uh, one is RCEP, that is Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership. Right. And uh, especially uh, at the moment where uh, Washington is reluctant to accept either TTP or TTIP, and uh, uh, Mr. President uh, uh, Trump wants only bilateral uh, deals. I think this RCEP is the uh, the, 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 the biggest uh, multilateral uh, trade arrangements which can be achieved. And I think this time the two leaders discussed uh, intensively on this issue and I'm hopeful that within a, a couple of months uh, mm -hmm. this uh, deal can be, can, can be uh, sealed. Song, there is another sort of international power dynamic going on here and that is the attempt by the United States to draw India into what's been referred to as the quad relationship together mm -hmm. with Australia and Japan. Mm -hmm. Is that of concern to China? Definitely, but uh, I think China is not feeling that much urgent on this issue. And uh, I have talked to a lot of uh, Indian friends. Uh, and, uh, they, they told me that, in fact, they want a kind of uh, realistic uh, cooperation with America, Japan, and uh, Australia, obviously. But uh, they also do not want to be uh, uh, involved in uh, many uh, multilateral uh, like military actions in the future if uh, America is going to confront China in South China Sea. Uh, I, I don't think India wants to be a part of uh, in, uh, mm. America's alliance. Another issue is that India strongly wants a kind of uh, uh, economic and trade arrangements in this uh, so-called uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, but until now I don't see any sign that Washington is interested to, to, to uh, bring any multilateral uh, trade arrangements into this. So, Rob, these two leaders uh, are scheduled to meet again in June at the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting. Um, Pre Prime Minister Modi has also invited President Xi to another informal meeting next year. Um, do you expect this relationship to flourish or are there challenges ahead? There's still a lot of work to be done. Oh, there's still a lot of work to be done, but as I said, the most important thing coming out of this meeting is that uh, whatever differences are there in this relationship will stay within this relationship and is to the advantage of no third party. It's also very important that they meet now so frequently in such important uh, occasions. We have the, uh, the BRICS every year. It's going to be the BRICS summit. It's going to be the SCO summit. Uh, this informal dialogue might not happen every year, but right. they've, they've kept it open that they might do this on short notice, and I anticipate it'll be done every year every, or every second year. And this itself, at such a high level, helps keep the relationship on an even keel so that when a lot of the stars align, this relationship can really shoot upwards. Otherwise, it'll be well managed, and I think that's good enough for the time being. Zarawa, I've got 30 seconds left. What do you see as the major challenges for this relationship? So I, I see this quite a remarkable relationship where both two rising powers have established fairly deep interdependent relationships despite having differences. Those differences are going to take a long time to resolve, particularly the territorial dispute. But I think the range of common interests and the range of their regional, global and bilateral interests have expanded so dramatically beyond their own expectations that they will be, by force of circumstances, deal with them and find more creative ways to manage them and grow upon them. So I see, I see a, a positive future on the common front and political will at the top needs to manage and control both the militaries on both sides to 
handle the frontier in a responsible fashion, in a mature fashion. If that happens, I think the sky is the limit for cooperation in Asia. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Anand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.